I'm really happy to be here. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, we are always happy to talk about housing on Bainbridge Island and housing can be really complicated, uh, full of acronyms, full of jargon. And so my goal here today is to just try some, to shed some light on the housing situation that we have here, answer some of the questions uh, that may be similar to these on the screen. These are the things we are most often asked. Um, and so I'm trying to, you know, I'll try to cover all that and share a lot about HRB, our mission, our housing, what we have and what we do here on a daily basis. So the definition of affordable um, is one of the big questions that we always get. What does affordable mean? Well, affordable is really a relative term, of course. Um, and whether or not someone's housing is affordable to them is very different for somebody who earns $25,000 a year from somebody who's earning $250,000 a year. Um, but when we talk about affordable at HRB, we are referring to what the HUD definition of affordability, um, which is where housing costs are 30% or less of gross income. And we also uh, refer to affordable housing as Sometimes I call it capital A affordable, uh, meaning that it has definitions and rules. We are serving certain populations um, based on their income. We have to <clears throat> use and charge certain rents based on the rules that our funding sources have. Um, most of the funding in our units comes from HUD or from Washington State. They help to build the units, and so they dictate who we serve and the rents that we charge and we are monitored annually. So that is that is kind of what we mean when we say affordable. So our work in this community at HRB, we have 100 units, a little over 100 units. Um, we tend to serve in our rental housing people that are at 50% of the area median income or below. Um, in addition to that, we have rental assistance programs that serve our own residents. Um, our rents are, as I said before, set by HUD rules, and they're below market rents, but we don't have any subsidized rent. And so many of our residents cannot afford even the low rents that we have. And so we further subsidize some of them um, with grant funds um, and funds that we raise. So we want to make sure that we are trying, we're working to keep people from being rent burdened. Um, we also have home ownership program. We have 44 units um, in our community land trust. Uh, most of them are at Ferncliffe Village. We'll talk a little more about that later down the line here. Um, we work with homeowners um, at our neighborhoods and as well as we work to assist home buyers in purchasing um, units with us, um, helping them get through the process of buying a house. We have some housing programs internally. We have an independent living a uh, program that is, it, it serves uh, folks to keep them safe at home, um, elderly and disabled mostly. Um, we do about 15 projects a year, things around um, installing grab bars, remodeling bathrooms, um, stair, stairs and ramps and or anything that helps somebody be able to live in their home safely. We also do things uh, like air quality, um, helping with the accumulation of stuff, which happens to all of us. Um, and then in addition to those things, we just get lots and lots of requests for housing assistance. People call and say, I'm losing my housing, my rent's going up, I don't know what to do, where to go. And so we spend time uh, just trying to help people find resources, referrals, um, and help them navigate what is a very complicated system overall. And then we also really want to continue and do a lot of education and advocacy, kind of like what we're doing today, just talking to groups um, of people about housing, why it's important, um, why they should care. So we do events like this. We do house parties, or we used to before COVID, and we hope to get back to them. We've done some virtual house parties, actually, which is where we just go to someone's home or their business or whatever and talk about housing. And the conversation is usually pretty fluid. People can ask all the questions they have and just try to allow people to walk away with more knowledge than they came in with. So if housing comes up as a topic of conversation, they can speak to that. So this gives you a sense of the rentals that are on Bainbridge Island. One of the questions we often get is, is there other affordable housing? Do you own all the affordable housing? And the answer is no, we don't. Um, there are a total of 286 units of affordable capital, what I call capital A affordable housing on the island that is regulated 
affordable housing. Um, we own, we are a part of the Island Terrace project. And so we own about a hundred of those units, as I said before, um, and the rest of them are owned by different entities. Um, housing Kitsap is one and then private developers are others. There are also some units that come with subsidy. As I mentioned, we don't have subsidy in our units. Um, subsidy is where the tenant is charged 30% of their income and then the subsidy picks up the remaining portion. So if someone can only afford $200 a month, but the rent is $700 a month and they pay the 200 and then the subsidy piece picks up the 500. Um, and there are about 167 units on the island with subsidy. Um, so not very many. There are long waiting lists for all of these properties. About 400 households are currently waiting to be given or be able to access housing, affordable housing on Bainbridge Island. Um, and so we have a long way to go to fill the gap for sure. So another big question that we often get is why is there no housing? Why is rent so high? Why is the market so tight? And there are several reasons for that, but one really, really big one is that we are not constructing enough housing. This is true here. This is true across the Northwest and even across the US. We just have not built enough housing over the 10 year, over the last 10 to 12 years to keep up with the demand. In Kitsap County, we have only built one house for every two households that is moving here. So it's a very simple concept of supply and demand. We just don't have enough. And there's a lot of demand. And when that happens, um, people at the very low end of the socioeconomic scale get pushed out first. Um, and then it starts to creep up the chain. And now we're finding, you know, many people, even of moderate um, means are being pushed out as well, pushed off Bainbridge, pushed into North Kitsap. People in North Kitsap are being pushed further south. People further south are being pushed into other counties. And so it is just kind of a cascading effect. Um, so that's, that's a one really large reason that we don't have enough housing. There are some other factors that contribute to that. Um, there's housing policy. It tends to preference home ownership, both federal and state, over rental living. So there's definitely a lack of rental housing across the nation. There is the construction of affordable housing is often very controversial. It brings up uh, nimbyism, which I'm sure you've heard, not in my backyard. People don't want it near them for various reasons. Um, there are lots of policy barriers, all kinds of zoning requirements and restrictions that make it very difficult and expensive to build. There's been a big generational shift in who's buying homes. Um, you know, we have baby boomers who are aging and would like to move into smaller homes. There are people in Generation X who are able to get back into the housing market after the downturn. So they're trying to buy these kind of modest, smaller homes. And then we have millennials who are now ready to buy homes. So we have all these groups that are competing essentially for the same house. Um, you know, moderate, moderate, normal, non-huge homes. And so there's just a lot of people who want it. And then of course, cost of labor and materials has just gone up and up and up and continues to do so. And of course, real wages, again, have not kept up with housing costs. People's wages are not going up at the same rate that the cost of housing is going up. So all of these things are why we're in a crisis. Um, this information here, Reynolds and Kitsap County, there is a national group called the National Low Income Housing Alliance, and they do a report every year called Out of Reach, where they basically look at every area of the country, county by county, and sometimes, you know, metro regions by metro region, and they figure out like what does it cost to rent something there um, and what does someone need to do. So in Kitsap County, our minimum wage does not afford anybody the ability to rent a home. The fair market rate for a two bedroom apartment or two bedroom rental in this county is 12, almost $1,300. And in order to afford that, you have to work 1.8 jobs, meaning almost 80 hours a week at minimum wage to be able to afford that. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah. And there's actually no place in the US that someone can earn minimum wage and afford housing in that area. Yeah. Literally no place, <laughs> no matter what state you're in. Yeah. So you can see that it is a huge issue just across across the nation. Yes. On Bainbridge Island, we're even a little worse off than in Kitsap because, as we all know, prices here are even higher than in the rest of the county. The average rent on Bainbridge Island is about $2,200, $2,300 a month. 
Um, it continues to rise. Um, there are no units that we could find that are rent for less than $1,500 a month. So everything is very expensive. And I will say there are definitely um, anecdotal things that we hear of landlords on the island that rent things for much less that are providing you know, a more affordable rental, but there's no official count of that. There's no way to, to know who those people are and how many there are. So, so I do hear from people saying, oh, I've lived in my rental for 20 years and my landlords have never raised my rent and it's great. <laughs> Yeah. We just don't have any idea of how many those how many of those there are, and I would guess you know that's kind of a unicorn. Um, yes. it's good for that person, but um, in general, it's quite an issue. One of the other big uh, questions that come up is who lives in your housing? Who lives in affordable housing? Who what what do people who live in in earn money you know fund money here? What can they afford to have? And so we created this chart as a way to hopefully illustrate the different people that we have in our housing and the different people and what people can afford based on their job. So we used a one person household and a four person household as an example. So someone who's earning at the 50% of area median income level for a one person household, that means they're earning about 32,000 a year. If it's a four person household, that means 45,000. Um, it tends to be positions like paraeducators, grocery store clerks, uh, people that work at Costco, Safeway, um, at the school district in, in those sorts of para jobs. Um, they can afford at most um, somewhere between $800 and $1,100 a month for rent. If they want to buy a house, they can afford somewhere around $145,000 to $238 ish. Kind of non existent. Right, exactly. It shows you how difficult it is for someone at that level. And if you kind of scroll down the chart, you can see as you go up, um, it gets slightly better. But even when you're down at the very bottom at the 150% of AMI level, um, which is considered moderate income, and that's teachers, that's firefighters, uh, people in professional jobs, even they are priced out of Bainbridge Island now because the average house is is you know 800,000 900,000 um and then they you know even finding rentals is really really hard because there's not enough number one and number two the prices are really high so you can see the issue um, and it affects people in all jobs all across the spectrum people that we definitely need to have in our communities and want to have in our communities and there's there's also a myth at times um about people that live in affordable housing. Um, there's a belief that they're different from us, that they're different from our friends, different from our families. It's simply not true. They are us, they are our friends, they are our family, um, they are just like us. There is no them. <laughs> we yeah. are all us. So it, you know, one of the things we like to try to dispel that myth is that there's something wrong with people that need to live in affordable housing, there is, there's nothing wrong with them other than they may have chosen a career that just doesn't pay as much as, as you know, a, a yeah. or whatever. It, it's just they, you know, we've all, we all have jobs that don't pay what we need to make to afford housing. So right. there's nothing wrong with anybody. We serve That's, all kinds of people. <laughs> those jobs are so essential. And, you know, to say that, you know, because you make this and you amount and you, have to live far away, then all of a sudden the expense of transportation comes up, which just makes it worse. And absolutely, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, we've all sat, I know, in traffic on 305 coming mm -hmm. and going, and it's it's because people have to drive here to work here. Right. And it's really impacting business because it's hard to find employees. If I live in, you know, Port Orchard and I'm driving here to work in a care facility, I pass. 10 care facilities on my way here. Why do I want to drive all the way here to work at one? <laughs> I can work Precisely. Precisely. You know? yeah. So it, it definitely has environmental impacts, um, huge environmental impacts as well. Yeah. So I want to just move into a little bit, um, we've talked about rentals a lot, so I wanted to talk a little bit about our home ownership program um, and share with you a little bit about community land trust and what that means. HRB is a community land trust organization. And what that means is that we conserve and steward land to develop affordable housing. And we do this so that we can provide 
um, quality housing opportunities that will serve Bainbridge Island in perpetuity forever. And so um, what that means and how that works effectively is that we separate the ownership of land from the ownership of the house. So the person's buying the structure of the home, but not the ground. We own the ground under it. Um, there are CLTs all over the US and, and the CLT, a nonprofit organization, owns the ground. When we sell that home to the home buyer, we enter into a ground lease with them that spells out the responsibilities of both the owner and the CLT, us. Um, and then within the ground lease, there's a resale formula that's built in that's, that basically defines what the homeowner can sell their home for in the future. And so that allows the home to be kept affordable for the next buyer. Um, CLT homes can be all in one neighborhood, similar to our Franklin Village neighborhood. On Bainbridge, they can be scattered around in different neighborhoods. They can be condos. Um, they can meet all kinds of, of different needs and different look, looks. They can look at a lot, a lot of different ways. Excellent. The Community Land Trust um, kind of came about, the history of it is really actually really interesting. The first one in the U.S. grew out of the Southern Civil Rights Movement uh, when a group of people from Georgia, from the new communities, uh, went over to Israel and adapted what they do have done in Israel with these agricultural co-ops. They have these co-ops there that are leased, they're on land that are leased from the Jewish National Fund. Um, and so they saw how that worked there and they came back here and they combined the community ownership of the land with the individual ownership of the houses. And so that's how it came, and came to be. And today there are more than 300 community land trust organizations across the nation. We have 13 in Washington state. Um, we are the fifth largest in Washington state. So it's a model that is spreading and has been proven effective in, in creating long-term affordability and creating long-term preservation of land for housing for the community. Excellent. So we have 44 homes, as I mentioned, um, in our community land trust. We have right now 30 households on our waiting list who would like to have a community land trust home. Um, part of our job as the CLT is to steward these homes and our buyers and our owners. Uh, we oversee all the home sales to ensure that those that purchase them are income qualified, they meet all the rules, um, and that when they go to sell it, that sales price is set and remains affordable. We want to make sure that the owners we sell to can afford their home. So we have a rule, a requirement that the house price, the house, the monthly mortgage payment can and housing costs can be no more than 35% of their monthly income. So slightly above that 30% that HUD sets. Um, and then we continue to support, there's an HOA in our neighborhood, for example, at Franklin Village, we try to support the HOA um, as they manage themselves. We work with potential buyers. Uh, they come in and apply, you know, wanting to own a home and we help them get ready for that. <coughs> Whether that's, <coughs> excuse me, reducing debt or um, saving, you know, working towards saving up money um, and then just helping them navigate the actual process as I'm sure if you own a home, you may remember how it's really challenging. The bank wants lots of information from you. <laughs> you have a lot of things you have to do in order to, to be approved for a loan. And so we just support people through that process. And then this uh, really illustrates what I mean by permanent affordability. We have uh, our Franklin Village neighborhood has 40 homes in it. Uh, we built that neighborhood starting um, in the first people moved in around 2012. Um, and we've had a few resales in the neighborhood that just illustrate how the affordability is retained. Um, so you can see here on the first one, for example, it was sold originally in May of 2012. Um, it was resold to another household in March of 2017. The first family paid $222,000. They were able to sell that for $236,000. The market appraisal on that house, had it been sold on the open market, would have been 457000 So you can see how that affordability is retained, and the owner does get what we call shared equity. They do get some return. So even though they're not making, you know, 200% equity, they do have some equity in that home and are able to walk away 
with some, some it generates some wealth for them. And it, you know, as you can see, they've just gotten the market appraisals are going up. <laughs> and at this point, I think we've had five or six resales. So I need to add those here to kind of continue to show the illustration, but um, it works is, is the bottom line. We're really proud to see how it's worked in our community. <clears throat> And another question that I often get from people uh, when we're talking about this is they want to understand how homes become affordable. What do we need to do to get them to affordability for the home buyer? And the answer is a lot of layers because it costs more to build the house or to buy the house than it does than the person that we're trying to work with can afford. And so we have to put a lot of funding sources into that to make it work. Um, we have private funding, private philanthropy dollars that we have. Um, fundraised or over time. Um, we have used programs like the SHOP program, which is a self-help program from HUD, uh, where we are able to get grant funds that can go into purchasing home sites or infrastructure. There is a USDA home loan program that works with families below 80% of very median income. Um, it's pretty limited. There's limited money available each year, but it is a really great effective way for people at 80% and below to afford a home and afford a home loan. There's down payment assistance available, um, also limited, but they are out there. Sometimes it's a loan to the person, sometimes it's a grant to the homeowner, it just depends. And then buyers also are bringing in their own personal savings, just like you know, one does when they buy a house, they save for a down payment. And so all of these things get compressed together um, to hopefully create affordability. And so I created, we created this slide to just sort of illustrate how we kind of illustrate this concept. So for example, when we're talking about uh, somebody with a household income or a family with a household income of 35,000, you know, we're talking about our paraeducator, our grocery store clerk, for example. Um, and I'm using a, this example that this comes from a, um, a recent, a potential project that may come and be built on Bainbridge um, called Winter Green that's in the news at City Council recently. Um, the developer there is, is building a neighborhood and, and some of the homes in that neighborhood have to be affordable. And so he is got a market sale price on these homes, these their townhomes of 349.5. And then he said to us, you know, I, I will contribute more than that. I will lower it even further down to 319. So he's gonna add in 30,000 of extra subsidy for our buyers. We do have some shop funding available to us right now, not very much, but a little bit. And so we would put that in there, that's 15,000. So that would bring us down to 304. Um, we have some of our own funding uh, that is set aside to do some scattered site community land trust work. And so we would add a little to that. So basically we're, we would be able with what we currently have to get down to about 294,000. Well, this particular buyer can't afford that. They need a much lower sale price. So we would try to get them some down payment assistance. That number illustrates 20% down payment. Um, it hopefully will be available. And then the primary mortgage then that they would hold at that point would be 235,000. And the bottom line here is with this household, that person needs a whole lot more than that. The, that this buyer won't be able to afford this house based on this. They would need an additional $90,000 to get down to what they can afford. So it's very, you can see kind of how it you can chip away at it and, and still be left with quite a large um, uh, gap to fill, if you will. But then if you, you know, as people move up in income and you can see here, as we get there, it gets, it, you know, as you have more income, it obviously becomes easier, right? The same situation um, gets us to a place where this buyer could afford it. The bottom line is if they use a USDA loan, um, they could afford this because their mortgage would be somewhat subsidized and they would be able to afford it. Um, if they can't use the USDA loan, then they're going to need to find a little bit of additional down payment assistance, um, probably about another 100000 if that isn't available. So it really, really depends on what funding sources are available, if USDA is available. It's kind of a complicated uh, pie to bake, if you will. and it, 
just takes a lot, it takes a lot of time and a lot of um, kind of just figuring out what's available. And then another one with 55,000, which again, just shows, you know, kind of illustrates that it's a little bit, as you earn more money, it's a little easier, but it's still a challenge um, for pretty much everyone um, in, in this 80% realm or 80% of AMI realm to afford to buy a home. We have to really get it down to a good low price. Does that make sense? That's kind of a lot to digest. <laughs> no, it does. It makes sense. It, and and uh, I can see where you're busy all the time crunching those numbers for folks. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, the bottom line is that, that, that we're not the only ones trying to get this funding. You know, it can be very competitive. So, um, we just need to have a lot more funding available. Exactly. So. So, and we can donate to HRB through One Call for All and directly, too. I mean, uh, <laughs> islanders can step up to the plate. Of course. <laughs> um, so we, you know, we just feel really strongly that everyone here, everybody who lives on Bainbridge Island and everybody who lives everywhere, really, should care about housing in their community. And, you know, the reason for that is, is it's just important to all of us, even if you never need our services, you never are gonna need to live in our housing or, or anybody you know is gonna need to live in our housing, it's still really important to all of us. We serve everyone in the community with our mission, no matter what. We are really, we wanna build a more inclusive Bainbridge. You know, if we let housing prices dictate who can live here, then, then who are we excluding? We're excluding so many people. Um, all the people that work here that make an essential and healthy community, uh, we are excluding our own children often who won't be able to come back and live here when they're adults. Uh, we are excluding people who've lived here for many years who are having to leave because they can't afford to stay here. It just, it, we really need to have a community, a robust um, housing portfolio that does have a range of options for a range of circumstances so that lots of different people of all backgrounds are welcome here. Um, you know, we view that how affordable housing is a community resource, just like a good school, having a great school district, which we do, having housing that's affordable is also key to keeping folks and keeping a community super healthy. Um, you know, we, we view affordable housing as the same as social justice. Um, where people live is really one of the biggest determinants of their health and well-being into the future. And so if you have safe housing that's affordable to you and you can live in a community that has high high quality amenities like great schools and health care and services um, then that is going to dictate the future for kids kids need that and so closing off our community to any to all these folks unless you're very affluent closing off the community it really consigns people lower income households to places that are less that have less amenities and less um, less health in their community and we really feel it's important. Um, we want to embrace and manage change. Um, there are lots of, uh, we don't feel like we have to forsake environmental stewardship or protection of natural lands or any of these other ethics that we have as a community. We think that we, we just don't want to sit back and let change happen to us. We want to make deliberate change. We want to address the need for growth and address these adverse market forces while also thinking about sustainability and and environmental and all of that we want everything everything works together nothing nothing is in a silo so these are kind of our the, the reasons we think that everybody should care <laughs> excellent yeah and then you know often just in closing i'll say we are often asked well what can i do what can i do and I would say learn more, just sharing what you know about housing, what you might have learned, um, if, you know, whatever you've taken away from this presentation, if anything, share that with others that you know. I think just having, talking about it more um, is what we need to be doing as well. And then signing up, you know, if we have newsletters, um, we have a Facebook page, please sign up if you're not already to receive those. Um, we, we work to keep everyone informed about what's going on in the community with regard to housing. We want to um, bring as much education and advocacy toward this issue as we can. I think HRB is a, a fantastic organization that we are very lucky to have here on Bainbridge. Um, one of my uh, 
things is that I would wish that everybody makes enough money here on Bainbridge Island in order to live here. You know, there's two ends to this mm -hmm. affordable housing, but also people making wages to be able to live in the community that where they work, I think is so important also. Yeah, that, I think I agree. I mean, creating, raising wages and finding a way to just pay people more is the other piece of the puzzle too, correct? I mean, exactly. Yes. We all, we all, everybody needs to earn a living wage and I think that is definitely something as a country we need to work on. And we really need a lot of work on that. So yeah, for sure. There are many, many, many things we need to do to solve this, to solve this issue and work at this issue. So absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Phaedra, for joining us today. Yeah, thank you for having me. It was really great. I appreciate it.